Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. Have you got an R7? If you do, you're probably wondering what lens you should buy for that camera. Well, I've spent the last month testing six different lenses. I've taken over 30,000 photos and I've been out in the field at least 15 times. I've got a real good appreciation for what these lenses can do. I'm gonna share lots of photos with you today, the pros, the cons, the weaknesses, which lens is best bang for its buck, which is the sharpest lens. I'm gonna cover all that today. Now it is gonna take me some time, so this is gonna be a long video. What I'm gonna do is break it into chapters. So below the video, you can click on a chapter which will have each lens if you're interested in a specific lens. And I'm gonna break it down into three specific categories. The first one being the sub $1,000 category, 1,000 to 2,000 and then 2,000 to 3,000. So I'm not gonna be reviewing the big 500 millimeter primes because those are outside the price range of most people who have the R7. All right, so the six lenses I managed to test was the EF 405.6, the 100 to 400 version two, the Sigma 150 to 600, the RF 100 to 400, the RF 100 to 500, and the RF 800. So a great selection and variety of lenses there, prime zooms, inexpensive to expensive. So it'll be interesting to just to compare them all to see which one uh, produces the best images. I also wanna outline what it is I'm actually testing when I use these lenses. Like what are we actually looking for? What is actually important? Now I've got it here on my phone so I can remember what we're going through. First one is obviously the sharpness. How sharp is it? What's the image quality like? What can you expect from the lens? Uh, image stabilization, like how what's your keeper rate when you shoot at slow shutter speed? So we'll be testing all these lenses at one one hundredth of a second, taking a burst and seeing what our keeper rate is. So that will be quite interesting. Uh, the autofocus, how accurate is the autofocus? How quick is it to go from subject to subject? Uh, the focal length, how much does it have? You know, some will be 400, some will be 600, 500, etc. Uh, the speed, that is the aperture, how much light do these lenses let in? Uh, what else have we got? The cost. So what's the value for money? Uh, is the cheaper lenses as good as the more expensive ones? Do you need to spend all that money? We'll be looking at that. Obviously, there's going to be zooms and primes. And of course, the minimum focus distance, as in how close can the subject get before it stops focusing? And just the overall build quality and whether it has weather sealing and just how does it feel? So those are the key factors. And at the end of the day, I can't tell you which lens to buy for your R7. That's ultimately your decision. And what my preferences are may be slightly different to yours. But what I can do is use these lenses and share all the photos I was able to get with them. And I can assure you I was able to get good shots with every single lens that I tested. So I'll also be using extenders quite a bit on these lenses because these mirrorless bodies take the 1.4 extender extremely well. The eye tracking autofocus works with the extenders and you don't notice that big of a drop, say like we did with DSLRs. So the extenders are actually a fairly affordable way to give us more reach on say these 400 millimeter lenses. So that'll be interesting to see how they perform. So I'll also share some raw files with you. I did actually test all these lenses on a toy galah. So you'll be able to see how the focal length and the sharpness and how these things differ from lens to lens. So feel free to download those raw files and pixel peep to your heart's content. All right, let's start with the sub $1,000 category. And I'm talking in US dollars because it's the easiest one for us to convert and compare. Now I want to start off with the EF lenses first, so the older lenses. And the first one I want to start is the old, my old favorite, the 405.6. This was my first birding lens. I'm never going to sell this lens and it's super sharp. So I was really curious to see how it would perform in the R7. So this lens was actually released way back in 1993. It's a 400 millimeter focal length lens. It's a prime lens. It has an aperture of 5.6, so it lets in quite a bit of light. So it's very light, it's very fast, and it's a great lens and you can no longer buy this new. So you have to buy it secondhand and it's going for around six to 700 US dollars. So that makes it quite an affordable uh, birding lens. One of the main features of this lens is it's very light. I think it's about 1.2 kilos, which is what's that 2.75 pounds, which makes it quite easy to hand hold. It's quite light and it's just an absolute dream to use. So, you know, you can hand hold this. It's a brilliant lens for bird and flight because it's quite fast at 5.6. It's the Accuracy of the autofocus is good. It's just a dream lens to use. And uh, I know many of you have this and can agree with me in that regard. So the obvious question is, does it work with the R7? And yes, it does. You do need to use an adapter with these older EF lenses. So an RF to EF adapter, you definitely need to use that. But you do get 100% autofocus coverage, which is really good. And the eye tracking works and it follows it around. So we have no issues with that autofocus whatsoever, which is really good. And I did actually get to test it first on some fairy 
friends that were just outside my house, a little male has popped up onto this bush and I've focused away and ratted off some shots. And when we review those shots, we can see that just how sharp this lens is. I, just, I honestly cannot stress how sharp it is. I was very happy with the result that we got from that fairy wren and I'm happy to see that it performs just as well on the R7 as it did on the older DSLR. So I did go out to a local wetland lake area to test out the lens. My first subject were just some tame um, silver gulls which make for good subjects. I was able to get pretty close and again the autofocus worked really well. You can see how the AF box just sticks on the eye, rattled off some shots and very very happy with that quality. Now 400 millimeters is possibly a little bit short on for birding these days. With the crop factor of 1.6400, you're getting 560 field of view or equivalent focal length. So that's pretty good. However, 400 on its own is probably just a bit too short. So what many of you will be aware of is that this lens does not actually have image stabilization. And that's a huge weakness of this lens. That means, you know, when you're hand holding, you're gonna get quite a bit of motion blur. Many of you have asked, how does the IBIS work? The IBIS helps but it doesn't overcome the lack of IS. So to test the keeper rate at low shutter speeds, I had Gary the Galar, I set the camera to 1 one hundredth of a second, which is really, really slow. I put it into the fastest speed mode, which is high frames per second, I think 15 for this lens. And I've initiated eye tracking, I've focused on the bird and I've just held down the shutter. So I'm focusing and firing away at the same time. And I just fired until I hit the buffer of the camera. And with this lens here, it was very, very poor to be honest. So unfortunately this was the worst lens I tested and I only got 10 shots sharp out of 99, so say 10%, which isn't all that good and it shows you just how important the IS is for these lenses for shooting handheld at low shutter speeds. So what that tells me is that even though this is a faster lens at 5.6, you are going to have to bump up that ISO to keep the shutter speed at say 1 400th of a second, which kind of negates that speed advantage because the other lenses will actually perform much better at low shutter speeds. So that's, you know, just something you need to be aware of. The other weakness of the lens is its minimum focus distance at three and a half meters. What that means is that if a bird comes within that, you simply can't focus on it and it just won't work. So I've also been asked to test this lens with a 1.4 converter. Now when we do that, it actually makes it a 560 millimeter F8 lens, which is actually not a bad focal length for birding. And I was keen to test out how that would perform. So I was, Still with those silver gulls, but I had a galah nearby, so I focused on the galah as it was feeding. Took this headshot, and as you can see, just amazing detail. That pink eye indicates that it's a female, and I was just very, very happy with the quality that we got. Okay, so after I'd finished photographing the galah and the silver gulls, I decided to go and have a look for something else to photograph. And it just so happened that this lake is usually full, but they'd actually drained it because they're trying to kill a weed that grows on the lake. And when they drain it, the weed's exposed to the frost and the frost kills it. That means that the lake bed is now open and all the birds are gonna feed on that. There's plenty of mud. So I drove around and I was stoked when I found some spoon bills feeding in some shallow water. So I've grabbed the 400, 5.6, the 1.4 converter. I scrambled down this bank to the muddy bottom and I quickly realized I couldn't go very far before I would start sinking. I did have my boots on, but I've sort of walked around position myself to try and get the best light angle of these spoonbills and I've just photographed these birds for a good hour or two and had a really good time like these birds were quite um, tame once I found my position and I crouched down nice and low the birds just started feeding and they actually did come quite close and I was very happy with the autofocus and just hammering away taking photos and I got this yellow billed spoonbill shot with its wings up it's feeding it's moving this is kind of everything I want in an image and I was over the moon with this one and that was taken with the setup so I was very happy with that now we also had the other spoonbill we have in Australia which is the royal spoonbill this bird is actually coming into breeding plumage where it gets these cool plumes coming out the back of its head and we managed to get a shot of that bird as well so that was really really cool almost ready to pack up as I was losing the light when a great egrets come in and landed and it started feeding and we had some nice reflections off the water and you can see in this shot it's just something slightly different some interesting colors and it's cleaned up extremely well I did use DxO Pure Raw which now works on the R7 and came away with a really good image now I thought that was 
I was done and dusted because the sun had gone down and I started walking back to the truck and as I'm walking back to the truck I just happened to glance to my right and I noticed some cormorants on a log over the water the sun was setting so we had this beautiful reflection on the what the water there was and it created this very interesting scene and I've just thought oh that would make a pretty interesting photo so just using the 405.6, I've framed up the composition, I've rattled off the shots, and here it is for you to see now. I'll be curious to know what you think, because this is something slightly different from me, but it just, I don't know, it just resonated with me, and I really like the composition and the feel, I like the reflection. I did have to take quite a lot of images, because I was trying to get those cormorants with their heads all to the side, so we could see their bills. If they were face on or looking behind them, it didn't quite work, so I was happy when this one finally did work. So overall, extremely happy with the photos I got with this lens. It performed extremely well. I did have really nice light, which helped, enabled me to have those high shutter speeds, low ISO. The light really does um, impact the quality of your shots. I can't stress that enough. Unfortunately, I didn't shoot in low light. If I had, I would have encountered some issues with sharp shots. Just without the IS, you're gonna have to have that one 400 that would have caused some issues. So something we need to be aware of. It is a real shame it lacks IS. It's a shame it doesn't get the FPS, the full FPS, and the minimum focus distance. If Canon addressed that and released this in the RF mount, it would be an absolute beast of a lens. As it is, it's just, you know, uh, it's sharp, it's really sharp, but it has some shortcomings. So just something to consider. So the other lens that doesn't get a lot of love for some reason, and it's very similar to this one, and that is the 300 f4 IS. So it's like this, it's a bit shorter, but it does have IS. You can whack a 1.4 converter on it and you get 420 5.6 IS. That lens is really cheap. I think it's about $350 used. For, it seems cheap to me, but with the converter, it then pushes it up to this price, which is around 600. So, um, you know, this one would probably autofocus a little bit better and you can use the 1.4 on this to give it even more reach. So something to consider, but it's definitely a lens worth looking up. Okay, so the second lens we're going to talk about is the Sigma 150-600 to Contemporary. This is probably by far the most requested lens for me to try on the R7. Many of you are, ver are very interested about this, and for a good reason. It costs 900 US brand new. It has a zoom range of 150 to 600. 600 millimeters is very long for under $1,000. It's quite fast at 6.3, and it's very sharp for what you get. And when we compare it to the 400 5.6 that we just talked about, it's clearly definitely a lot bigger. But when we compare the difference of 600 to 400, you can see just how much bigger 600 is. You don't have to crop as much and the subject's just gonna be way, way bigger, which is a clear advantage. But of interest, when we put the 1.4 on the 400, we can see that 560 is very close to 600 and there's not a lot between them. Now I did actually take some really cool shots with this lens. I had the most amazing sunrise and you can see in this shot here the color, the dead trees. We did actually have a couple of small birds, a couple of cockatoos in front of the sun that you can see there. Um, this was a really, really cool image that I um, picked up. And when the AF locks on, the quality is just fantastic. And we can see in this Jackie Winter, plenty of detail. It's very sharp. I have no issues with the image quality coming out of this lens whatsoever. I also got to test this lens on some motorbikes, which is outside my wheelhouse, but it tracked the motorbikes pretty well and I got some really good shots using this lens in that scenario. So overall, I had a lot of fun with this lens. We got some really good shots. However, it's starting to sound too good to be true, and unfortunately it is. As you know, there are some AF issues and inconsistencies with this lens. So what I have found is that it pulses when you get close to the subject. When I say pulse, it, you get sharp, sharp, soft, sharp. It just seems to lose focus on and off the subject. Now, something else worth pointing out is the R7 does have some inconsistency issues of its own when in eye tracking. I've noticed over using it all this time now that it's just nowhere near as accurate or sticky as the R5. For whatever reason, it often loses the subject and then goes back onto it. So, and in low light, it's even worse. So combine the pulsing of the lens with the, some issues with the R7's autofocus and your keeper rate is gonna be quite low. And when I tested this lens at one one hundredth of a second, it was pretty bad. It was almost as bad as the 405.6. I only got 18% keeper rate. Uh, that's partly due to the length of the lens. So the longer the lens, the less keepers you'll have. But I just struggled to keep it steady in the viewfinder if I'm being completely honest. So it does have image stabilization, but just the weight of it, it's just quite heavy. And when I'm hand holding, 
I'm shaky at the best of times, but over time it gets quite heavy and it was just a lot harder to hold steady than the smaller, lighter lenses. Weight is an issue for you. You're probably gonna to have to use a monopod or a tripod to get the most out of this lens, which then reduces its usefulness just walking around in the bush and just makes it slightly different to those lighter zoom lenses or prime lenses that we're gonna talk about today. So overall, you know, a very, very good lens, but it's just a shame it has those autofocus issues. So the interesting thing with this lens is many of you have reached out and said that you're actually getting more keepers with this lens on the R7 than you were on the 7D and the 90D because the eye tracking of this camera is so good. So even though it has some autofocus issues, many of you are saying that you're actually still very happy with it and that's something to take into account. So the next lens I want to talk about actually falls into that focal length of 100 to 400 that is extremely popular and I know many of you have this lens. And there are actually quite a few options. Tamron and Sigma both have a, an affordable 100 to 400 lens, and you could get the old 100 to 400 version one Canon, but I believe there's a lens that is better than all three of those. And that lens is the Canon RF 100 to 400. Yes, this tiny lens in my hand is a 100 to 400. And when we zoom out, you can see just how much smaller it is than that big Sigma 150 to 600. In fact, it's absolutely tiny. And one of the things that makes this lens so incredible is just the weight of the lens. I think it's around 635 grams, which is literally nothing. It's so light that, you know, you don't even really know that you've got this lens. And it's an absolute star. And I would say this is probably the best valued lens I have ever used. And it's a full credit to Canon for producing a lens such as this. So let's talk about it. All right, so I've whacked it on the tripod and the first thing you'll probably notice is there's nowhere to actually put an Arca Swiss plate. There's no way to mount that. You have to actually mount the camera onto your tripod or monopod. So it's not a massive issue because the lens is so light, but it would, will cause some um, issues when it comes to balancing your uh, gimbal because it just falls forward. There's no way to balance it. So it's not really a lens that you would use on a tripod or monitor. It's so light that you wouldn't do it anyway. So it's not really an issue. And I think what is incredible is that this lens is currently on sale, believe it or not. I think it's 599 US dollars or 600. It's pretty much the same price as that Canon 405.6 but this is brand new. It's an RF mount, so you don't need any adapter. It goes directly onto the R7. It gives us 100 to 400, and this 400 is actually very close to 400 millimeters. A lot of zoom lenses aren't truly 400. I was surprised that this one is a lot better than um, others I've tested, and when we compare it to the 405.6, we can see it's very similar. Now on the sharpness level, as you can see in this image, the 405.6 is the sharper lens, and that's to be expected. These, old, these prime lenses are generally slightly sharper, but it, it doesn't put this to shame. It still does work pretty well. So let's just go through the amazing specs of this lens first. The weight of it, as I mentioned, 635 grams or 1.4 pounds. This combination here of camera and lens weighs in at about 2.7 pounds or 1.2 kilos. So this combo, this combo weighs exactly the same as this entire lens. So what that means is that you can handhold this all day long without an issue. I know some of you may struggle with lenses with their weight and hand holding. You can put this in your backpack, you can walk around with this and it's the ideal travel lens. To have 400 millimeters this light in this sort of package, it's a bit of a game changer to be honest. And I would recommend this in a heartbeat to anyone who has any issues with weight whatsoever and wants a nice sharp lens at this price point in this weight bracket, so pretty amazing. So how do they make it that light and that small? Well, this has a max aperture of f8 at 400 millimeters. f8 is actually pretty slow. When we talk about speed or slowness, we're talking about how much light travels through the lens and hits the sensor. So this here is obviously the 405.6. So this has a max aperture of 5.6. 5.6 is one stop quicker than f8. What that means is this lens lets in twice as much light as this one. So let's say we were at ISO 3200 on this lens at f8. We can then use this lens, we get 5.6 aperture, one stop less, we could use ISO 1600 with this lens. So in low light, the faster the lens, the better, because you're letting more light in. So in low light, you will have some issues with this lens. You will have to use slower shutter speeds, but that can be kind of negated with class leading image stabilization in IBIS. And this combo here, Believe it or not, get ready for this. I did the 1 100th test, and this lens came in at 76% sharp shots. That is incredible. 
largely due to the IS and how light it is, makes it much easier to handhold. But to get that sort of keeper rate at one one hundredth of a second means that the F8 isn't as big of a deal because you will be able to use slow shutter speeds, uh, which is really, really good. So I managed to get into the field with this combo. Uh, the first bird I struck was the iconic Sulphur Crested Cockatoo. Now I had a lot of light in this situation and I was able to get quite close to these cockatoos and I took plenty of shots. And when we zoom in, you can see just how much detail there is. So this is sort of the best possible conditions. And in these conditions, the lens performed exceptionally well. Very, very happy with the autofocus, the speed, the quality, everything, no problem whatsoever. So as I mentioned with the 405.6, 400 millimeters is a little bit short and I had a few occasions where I just couldn't get the bird big enough. So we had this little pied cormorant and it was sort of on the opposite side of this little wetland and I just couldn't make the bird any bigger at 400 millimeters. And at f8, 400 millimeters means your background is not gonna go that out of focus. And this white plumed honey eater landed on a log. I've pointed, I've taken the shot, but the background was too close to the bird, which has created this distracting background. If I'd had, say, the Sigma 600 at 6.3 or 7.1, we would have blurred out that background a lot more. So that's something to consider with these lenses. You're not gonna get that same shallow depth of field. However, one way to overcome that, as we did with the 400, is to put a 1.4 converter on this lens. It will take the latest RF 1.4 converter. If we whack that on there, it now becomes a 140 to 560 f11, <laughs> which is quite a good zoom range and is plenty of focal length when you consider the crop factor of the R7. Now, f11 is very slow. It's now two stops slower than the 5.6, and you will have issues in low light. So I decided to go out and try that combo and just see what sort of shots we can get. So I returned to the same lake to have another session and I've gone to the other side of the lake and I actually made a YouTuber error um, that you don't wanna make. What I did is I parked my truck and I sort of looked outside and I thought, well, there can't be too many birds here. So I left all my recording gear in the truck. I just grabbed this combo and it's so light that you can just wander around with it, not without an issue whatsoever. So I'm just wandering around, sort of camera in one hand, just walking over these dead logs because the lake was very low and I'm just walking around not really expecting to see anything just doing a recce really to think whether it was worth me staying at this location and then out of the corner of my eye I spotted my nemesis bird my nemesis bird is the azure kingfisher and when I say nemesis the reason I use that for anyone who's been birding for any time what you'll discover is certain birds are very difficult to photograph for whatever reason they avoid you they're really really tricky the Azure Kingfisher is it for me. So I went into full birding nerd mode. I forgot about YouTube and I just went about trying to photograph this bird. Now, what I think would be an interesting exercise is to show you my progression of shots of how I went about trying to photograph this bird. All gear can take good and bad shots. So why don't I show you the very first shot I got of this Kingfisher and you can see I was actually against the sun, so it was backlit. The bird was ages away, it was far off and it was down low, absolutely awful shot. So clearly I needed to get closer, clearly I needed to change my position. So I've kept my eye on the bird and I've started walking around to get the sun coming over my shoulder. And as I'm going, I'm taking insurance shots. And as we get move around, we start to get better light angle. You can see in this shot that it's starting to get a lot better, but I still wasn't happy. We, the bird was still too far away. I didn't quite like where it was positioned. As I'm moving around, I'm getting into a really good position. I think I'm about to nail it. The bird drops down and then off it goes. It flies away and oh, the bird won again. I thought, oh no, but I wasn't gonna give up. I've actually then followed the direction that the bird took. I've gone over some logs and to my surprise, I've actually stumbled across the bird. It was now on a different log and I've managed to get quite close. I've framed it up, rattled off a heap of shots and I was absolutely elated that I finally got a shot of this bird that I'm happy with, and here's the shot now. Just awesome, I just love the log, I love the pose, the detail's excellent. Overall, a very, very nice shot that I was extremely happy with. That bird is no longer my nemesis bird, but the joy wasn't over, I wasn't gonna stop photographing this bird. It's actually flown back towards where it was previously on that same log. So I've made a beeline, I knew where I needed to go and it ended up the best place for me to be was on this log, standing on this log to get a bit of height, a bit precarious, but um, anyway, we've lined it up and I managed to get some really nice shots that I'm very happy with. The bird has been fishing on this log and it's dropped down and it's given me a couple of really good poses that I captured, but the one I wanna end on 
is this one that it's got a tiny little fish in its mouth. I would have liked to have been closer, but overall, just absolutely stoked with this image. Very, very happy. So I've sort of left that location over the moon and I quickly drove back to where I was the other night with those cormorants to try and get the same sort of backlit shot. The water levels had risen, so that log the um, cormorants were on had disappeared, but I still looked out for something else. I was hoping for a pelican or something else I could do backlit. And sure enough, a cormorant has actually, it was coming across the water and then it started flapping its wings and I'm madly taking shots as it's flapping its wings. And we managed to get this shot here. I'm curious to know what you think of it. I really like this shot. There's something about it which makes it different. Like you can't quite figure out what it is straight away. Like, is it a cormorant? Is it a swan? What's going on? It's purely just the bird's got its wings up, but because it's in a silhouette, it creates this really cool shape with a nice reflection, nice color. And again, just something completely different. Overall, very happy with that session. Now, that wasn't the last time I used this lens. I couldn't help but use it because I love using it so much. I actually just chucked it in the car. I'd gone to work all day, had about an hour after work, and I've gone to a wetland in a town, and I've decided just to wander around and see what I could photograph. And believe it or not, you wouldn't read about it, I stumbled across another Azure Kingfisher. So 11 years I struggle and then all of a sudden I'm getting multiple sessions with the, the bird. Different location, but the same species. First time though, it was a little bit too far away. I was at 400, so I've taken the converter off and you can see that the bird's a little bit small, background's kind of in focus. It's still okay, it's still a good shot, but I wanted more detail. I've photographed some other things. As I'm ready to go home, I've spotted another bird. This time it was in a eucalypt, a little bit too high, took a few shots wasn't that happy with it. The birds then dropped down on another log. I've moved over to it, following it around. Got a better shot, but we wanted to get closer. Finally, it's dropped into the water. It's flown to another perch, and this time it was just all go. It was perfect. Like this bird wasn't that far away. I've lifted up the camera now. The light was quite low at this point, and I've taken a few short shots, and I thought, why not let's try a really slow shutter speed? Let's just dial in 1 50th of a second and see what sort of shots we can get. Let's test out the IS and the IBIS. Now I did have the 1.4 converter on, so I was at 560 f11. I've lifted it up and I've just hit the shutter, taken a burst of shots at 1 50th of a second. And to my surprise, there were quite a few sharp shots at that slow shutter speed. And here's the shot I was able to get. Absolutely stunning, beautiful shot of this bird. And what that shows is what is possible with a thousand dollar combo on the R7, so two and a half thousand US is going to get you shots like this at very slow shutter speeds. And I truly believe anyone who gets this kit will be able to get good shots. Now, it is important to stress that this doesn't have weather sealing, it is a budget lens, it is quite slow, but you expect that at that price point. Everything else I've talked about makes this well worthy of the investment, and I probably of the sub $1,000 lenses, this was by far the most fun and I would have no issue recommending this whatsoever. Just amazing. Alrighty, so we're gonna go from the 100 to 400 up to the RF 800. It's a massive difference between the two, 800 millimeters versus 400 millimeters. And this is a very interesting and unique lens from Canon. Pretty controversial being an F11 fixed aperture lens, but you're not gonna get 800 millimeters under $1,000 pretty much any other way and the ability to get 800 millimeters is, is just stunning. Like if we look at the difference between this lens, 800, and this lens, 400, you can see just how much bigger the bird is. The field of view is quite narrow, but it makes that subject much, much bigger. And if you want a lot of reach, then it's gonna be hard to beat this lens. So the other interesting thing about this lens is just its weight. It's actually very light. Believe it or not, I think it's around 1270 grams or something like that. It actually weighs the same as the 405.6 and you can handhold this quite easily. To be able to handhold 800 millimeters is quite unique and it makes it very, very cool. However, as we increase the focal length, we also need to increase our shutter speed to get sharp shots. And even though this lens has IS and this has IBIS, when I did my 100th test for keepers, this lens really struggled. I actually only got sort of similar to the Sigma. I only got about 18% keeper rate using this combination. And I believe that is because of the focal length, but something else I've also noticed with this lens, 
is it has some AF inconsistencies, very similar to the Sigma to be honest. It doesn't pulse quite as much, but we still have that sharp, sharp, soft, sharp sort of thing going on. And when we combine that with the R7 autofocus, it does struggle and it will struggle in low light. And overall, I did have some issues with the autofocus. So that's a bit of a downer. Obviously that F11 means that you need a lot of light and even shooting birds in flight with this combo, I was finding to get that shutter speed up, I was having to use say ISO 1600 on the R7, which does bring in a bit of noise, especially if you increase the shadows. So F11 is a big compromise. However, if you have nice light, as I did when I tested this lens, you can get some absolutely stellar images. Now I went to a local wetland and I managed to have a wonderful session with some flame robins. These are the most beautiful birds you've ever seen. I did an entire video on it, you're free to watch. But I did handhold and I did manage to get some amazing shots. And you can see with this viewfinder footage, the birds jumped up onto the perch, the eye tracking's gone to the eye. I've rattled off a heap of shots and we managed to get quite a few sharp shots and I managed to get this cracking image that I'm so happy with. The detail's fantastic. Overall, a really quality image that I'm very happy with. And with this extra focal length at 800 millimeters, it just means you can photograph far off birds and make them much bigger. So I had this brown falcon that was in a tree and it was at least, I don't know, 40, 50 meters away. And we did take some shots. Yes, the bird's still small, but I was able to get a shot, which I don't think I would have been able to do with any other lens. Now, something else you need to consider with this amount of focal length is atmospheric conditions. You will get more heat haze, you will get some issues, and you might use this lens and not get anything sharp, and you'll be going, what's wrong with the lens? Sometimes it's just to do with atmospheric conditions. If, the, if there's pollution or air pollution, or there's a difference between the temperature of the land and outside, you'll get this haze, heat haze going on, which just wrecks all your shots. So that's gonna be a lot more pronounced with a lens of this length. Even though I've talked about the AF struggles and having higher shutter speeds, it's funny that you have all these rules, but a lot of the time you can just take photos and hope for the best. And I had just that. The sun had gone down, I was driving home, saw a heap of kangaroos on the side of the road, and I thought, why not just try and take some shots? So I used a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second, which is ridiculous. It's very, very slow. I shouldn't have been able to get any sharp shots, but I thought, why not just do a burst of photos? So handheld, I've just focused on the kangaroo, it's found the eye, it did actually lock onto the eye. I've taken a burst and yes, the majority of them were soft, however, it only took one to be sharp and I did get quite a few sharp ones. And we got this headshot of this kangaroo after the sun had gone down in very low light off with an F11 lens at such a slow shutter speed, it's possible. So it's not something I would uh, recommend or suggest, but it definitely is still possible. It's just your keeper rate's gonna be much, much lower. So the other thing we need to consider when using a lens with so much focal length is the field of view is very narrow. So when we're trying to find the subject in the viewfinder and the bird's moving around, it's very hard to actually locate the subject and you'll spend a heap of time just trying to find it and it can be very frustrating. And with the 1.6 crop factor, we've got an even narrower field of view. So it's even harder than it is on a full frame camera. So just something you need to be aware of, you will miss shots just not been able to find the subject. So that is a real challenge. And even for bird in flight, it's quite difficult. As you can imagine, trying to find a bird in the sky with this sort of focal length is a real issue. The other thing I have to mention is the poor minimum focus distance. It's six meters. It's the worst of any lens I've ever tested. It means if a bird comes within six meters, we can't focus on it. We can obviously use extension tubes, which will reduce that. I'm not sure exactly how much it reduces it, but it's a bit of a pain to use those, but that is an option. So obviously the 405.6, the 100 to 400 can use a two times to create an 800 F11. I get asked, how does this lens compare? Well, I did do some comparison shots, which will be in the raw files you can download. Overall, this lens was just much, much sharper than those with the two times converter. The two times just kind of ruins the IQ, slows down the AF. So this is by far a sharper 800 F11 than those two lenses are. So which is the best lens in the sub $1,000 market? which maybe should ask that kookaburra who's letting us know about it. But I don't think there is one lens that's better, you know. Each of them has a weakness. What, some of them are slower than the others. Some of them have less focal length. Some of them are heavier, some of them are lighter. There's all these variations and not one lens is perfect for you or for any situation. So you need to determine which features are the most important for you and choose the lens which best suits your style. For me here in Australia, with the amount of light that we get, 
I would probably go with the 100 to 400 and the 1.4 converter, the RF version. It's just so much fun to use. It's very versatile. It's very light. It's just a dream to use. And I think for its price, it's an absolute bargain. Now, if you need more speed and you want the sharpest lens, then probably that 405.6. It's so sharp and it's at f8 it, with a converter. It's just fantastic. You know, if you want uh, reach, then there's clearly this one. And then the Sigma is probably the, the all-rounder. If you can put up with those AF issues, you will get some nice shots. So uh, food for thought, but there's not one lens, unfortunately. All right, so that brings us to the $1,000 to $2,000 bracket. And I don't actually have any lenses that fall in that bracket here to test, but there are a few available. The most obvious one is the Tamron 150 to 600 G2 which I have tested on the R5, and I did get some nice shots, but I did have some AF issues. Now, I haven't tested it on the R7, but fellow YouTuber Wild Alaska has tested the R7 and the, the Tamron. I'll leave a link below. I believe he had very similar um, issues with AF consistency. Just check his video out for his opinion on that. That lens is slightly more expensive than the Sigma due to the build quality, the weather ceiling, but from what I understand, from my experience, the Sigma might be slightly sharper than that Tamron lens. Now the other couple of lenses which just make it into this bracket is the Sigma 150 to 600 Sport version and the Sigma 60 to 600 uh, lens that they've released. Now those lenses are very heavy lenses. I think they're close to three kilos. They are big lenses. They're big and heavy and expensive because they have weather sealing. Um, they're just better built lenses. However, I don't know whether those lenses suffer from the same pulsing and AF issues as the contemporary. From the feedback I've got from you, it appears that maybe they do. Um, I would love to hear from you in the comments. Please let us know if you've got the Sport or the 60 to 600, whether you have any AF issues whatsoever. So they would be good choices for the R7, but it's hard to recommend them unless I know how the autofocus performs. And at 2000 US, you're getting very close to the RF 100 to 500, which is a far superior lens in my opinion. So something to think about. All right, so let's jump into the two to $3,000 category. These lenses are now getting pretty expensive and they're almost double the price of the camera itself. The first lens in that bracket is Canon's EF 100-400 version 2. This lens probably shouldn't even be in this bracket. Believe it or not, a couple of years ago in 2019, this lens retailed for 1800 US and now retails for 2400 US. So a jump of $600. I'm not sure why Canon's bumped up the price so much. Kind of makes it expensive for what it is, in my opinion, considering its age. Now, it's good to know that you can pick this up secondhand for around 1600. So you can get the exact same lens for a lot cheaper at 1600. Now, this is a much better lens than the first version. That version had some sharpness issues at 400, some dust issues. But I know many of you have this lens and I'm really keen to find out how it performs because this lens is way sharper than its original. It's got great IS. It's overall a wonderful lens. The minimum focus distance is a real highlight. It's under a meter so you can use it like a macro lens. Overall a wonderful lens. Probably Canon's best telephoto zoom lens before the 100 to 500 came out. First thing that we need to have a chat about and it becomes instantly noticeable after using all these lenses is when I pick it up it's actually quite chunky. It's actually quite heavy. Surprisingly I think it's around 3.6, 3.5 pounds um, or 1.6 kilos. So it's quite hefty. It's a lot heavier than the, way heavier than the RF 100 to 400 or even the 405.6. It's only a couple hundred grams lighter than that Sigma. So you know it's not too bad. I probably be able to handhold this without too many issues, but some of you may struggle with that weight over a longer period of time. Does that impact our keeper rate? Well, it did for me. So when I did my one 100th test on this, I was a bit disappointed. I only got 50% of my shots sharp. Now, I don't know why exactly that is, because the IS is very good on this. Maybe I was just shaking a bit more and that's what we got, 50%. So it's still good, but nowhere near as good as the RF, which was at, what was that, 76%. The other thing that you'll notice straight away when I use this lens is it's not 400 millimeters. It's way shorter than that. I don't know what it is, maybe 360 or 370 when you're fully zoomed out. And you can see that when we compare it to the 405.6. Look at the difference. The 405.6, the bird is way bigger. Now, some lenses do suffer from focused breathing and some lenses are shorter the closer you get. And that is the case with these lenses. So it's something to keep in mind. But it's, it's way shorter than that 400. And even when we compare it to the 100 to 400, 
which is obviously a much cheaper lens. That 100 to 400 is actually bigger. It's much closer to 400 than this lens is. So um, definitely something going on with this lens and something you need to be aware of. On a full frame, it's just way too short and it does feel short. For me, I would probably say you'd need an extender with this lens to make the most of it, but it will work with an extender. With a 1.4, it goes to that 560 f8, which is actually a really nice length for birding and the AF will work fine. Of course, that's gonna bump the price up even further, but I wanted to see how this would work. So I've gone out at 400 millimeters to take some shots and I actually didn't have too many birds about. So I started off with a bee that was feeding on a rice flower just outside my house. And you can see how well it does for those macro style shots. You can see the pollen all over this bee's head, worked really well. I think this lens for flowers, macro, you name it, this lens is really good for it. This beautiful Australian flower that we have, this uh, Kunzia Baxteria. Look at that red flower, it looks amazing. Very happy with that. But I did get to photograph a bird and it was my trusty uh, superb fairy wren. So I've managed to um, sit down and get some shots of the fairy wren as it was bouncing around. And it's just so sharp, this lens. For a zoom lens, it's very, very sharp. And I was very happy with the results I got. I was fairly close to this fairy wren. So I was very happy with how that turned out and overall very, very good. But I needed to go out into the field to test this lens and I wanted to test it with the 1.4 converter. So where was I gonna go? I was gonna go straight back to where I'd previously been because I wanted another session with that Azure Kingfisher. So I've managed to go back to that same spot. I didn't really think I was gonna get lucky two days in a row, but sure enough, I've actually stumbled across that Azure Kingfisher again. This time I recorded it, and this time I got even better shots perhaps than I did the day before. I had a wonderful time. Here's one of the shots I was able to get of that Azure Kingfisher, and the detail is just fantastic. The light hitting the bird, the IQ, everything about it is just amazing. Now I did get quite close, I had nice light, but it just shows that this setup, the eye tracking worked well, and I just got so many good shots, it was just ridiculous. So very, very happy with how that turned out. Now the bird did fly off and I've ventured back to where I thought it might have gone. So as I've walked around looking for the Kingfisher again, I've stumbled across a little pied cormorant. Now the beauty of these zoom lenses is you can change your composition quite easily. So this bird had landed on a dead stump and as you can see, this is very, very wide. Now I wonder if you can tell what's going on here. It's a bit of funny on the old eye. We can see that tone, that sort of light brown color at the bottom half and then a different color above that. What you're actually looking there is that's all at where it's brown is usually submerged. So because the water levels were so low, it's revealed all these dead stumps that were in the water. So they were big trees previously, they flooded the area. Well, they've gone underwater and most of those trees have snapped off and died. So when it's full, you don't see it, but when it's empty, you do see it. The cormorants perched on that dead log and we got these interesting shots. So the cormorant has then dropped down and it landed on another log going over the water. And just before I show you that photo, this is one of the highlights of birding, one of the highlights of being out and about, as you stumble across other birders or other people enjoying photography, and you end up just having really nice conversations. So a big shout out to Zoe and Andrew, who uh, approached me and we had a great conversation, and we actually photographed this cormorant together. So we've had a great time, and the cormorant has landed, it's opened up its wings, and you can see here from this pose, we've got some great detail, great eye contact, everything just works. So these cormorants, they need to pose like this because they have special feathers which let them go under the water and stay under the water, but they struggle to fly when those feathers are wet, hence why they have their arms out like that all the time. So um, a great session I had with that cormorant. I've left there, I've started to drive home. The sun had sort of gone down, but I hadn't given up yet. So I've grabbed my camera and I've gone out onto this um, interesting landscape. And I actually spotted a couple of uh, royal spoonbills sort of walking through the mud. I've gone down, not expecting too much because the light had gone, but I thought, why not? I'll give it a go. And the mud started to get a bit deeper and I've sort of, stalk these birds. I ended up having to walk over this log to get out of the mud, sort of get to them. They'd found a small puddle or 
little bit of water that they were feeding in and I've managed to line them up, had a session with them. Got this photo which is okay, it's not the best one I've ever taken. This is just showing you some low light performance, um, how it sort of works in low light and the AF did struggle at times in low light because of the R7 but overall got some nice shots that I'm happy with. With DxO Pure Raw it's scrubbed up pretty well. So overall I had a wonderful session. I think if you already own this lens I'd be just be using the 1.4 converter on your R7. You're going to have an amazing kit downside is that weight and uh, apart from that it's it's awesome it's got the weather ceiling it's an L series lens beautiful lens good combo very happy with how that performed alrighty so I've saved the best for last and the last lens is the Canon RF 100 to 500 it's a couple of years old but this lens is absolutely amazing one of the best zoom lenses I have ever used and the reason for that is Canon have just piled in all their technology into this lens it's super sharp it's super light the is is amazing it's just a beautiful lens to use now as i mentioned the weight the weight is incredible you've got 500 millimeters so if we turn it out to 500 millimeters this lens weighs i think about three pounds or 1.3 kilos that is insane it's, so it's quite a bit lighter than that 100 to 400 we just talked about and it means you can hand hold this lens you can adapt to situations and it's no issue whatsoever and that is a huge advantage to have this sort of range the 500 millimeters and this sort of package just makes it an absolute dream to use and it's it's a real real feature that I can't stress enough and it's quite small when you take the lens cap off it's not as big as some of these other lenses so you can pack it away put it in your bag etc and coupled to the R7s with the 1.6 crop factor we get a field of view of what's that 160 to 800 millimeters which is a wonderful range for birding and probably as much as you'll ever need you could use a 1.4 converter and it will work but you know only in those certain situations I don't think you'd have to use the converter all that often and I haven't really I've just used it as is 100 to 500. Now this lens is controversial and I'm no doubt going to get some comments below it, it, the reason it's controversial is the cost for one this lens retails it's gone up $200 unfortunately I think it's $2899 so $2900 US so over, just over 4000 in Australia here it's expensive and it, it is expensive and I, and I will admit that however all of Canon's L series RF lenses are but the reason they're expensive is just because how good they are the, the quality as I've mentioned the weather ceiling the, everything's so good about it so in isolation it's probably okay you know it's a lot of money but in isolation you're getting a great quality product for what you pay for the reason people have a bit of angst and the reason people are upset is we are often heard or most people are comparing this to the Sony 200 to 600 6.3 that lens is two thousand dollars so it is significantly cheaper than this lens to be honest I think that Sony is underpriced they could probably charge more for that lens the other thing people will comment on is they'll say well it's not a 600 millimeter lens it's only 500 the, the Sony 600 and the Sony slightly faster at 6.3 all these things are true and I'm not doubting that the 200 to 600 is a beautiful lens but I don't think we can compare the two lenses this here is like a pimped up 100 to 400 it's so light and versatile it's a dream to use whereas the Sony's and the Sigma's these are all much bigger lenses and they're all much much heavier I think the Sony's over two kilos and just the size of it means they're nowhere near as versatile you're probably going to have to use a monopod or a tripod if you're using it for long periods and they're just different lenses in different categories the other thing is people will complain about is they'll say Dwayne this is only a 7.1 it's way too slow 7.1 is ridiculous it's not that ridiculous and it's not that slow the IS of this lens is so good that you can shoot handheld at very slow shutter speeds believe it or not in my test at 1 100th of a second this lens wait for it 80% sharp shots I got 80% of the shots were sharp at 1 100th of a second wide open at 7.1 I'd highly doubt any of those 600 lenses would perform that well at such a slow shutter speed and that is the advantage to this lens and I did try this out I put the 1.4 converter on this so that gave me what's that 700 millimeters and I think my success rate dropped from 80 to 60 and when I put it two times on I think I had a thousand I think the success rate then dropped to 30 or 40 percent so it clearly shows the longer the focal length 
the harder time you'll have hand holding or using those slow shutter speeds. So it's just something you need to be aware of. This lens is also very sharp, 7.1. So I just leave it on that and fire away without an issue whatsoever. So I don't think the 7.1 is as big of an issue as people are saying. It's only a third of a stop slower as well compared to those 6.3 lenses. That's like going from ISO 640 to ISO 800. It's, it's pretty much negligible and with the ISO performance of these later cameras, the much better DxO Pure RAW etc, I wouldn't be worried about the aperture of 7.1 on this lens. I do agree that we do need a 200 to 600 or 150 to 600 on the RF mount and I hope that happens in the future. It would be great to have that option because that Sony lens is an amazing lens uh, for its price and I do wish we had that on Canon. But if you want more focal length, as I mentioned, you can put the 1.4 extender on this lens. Unfortunately, due to an engineering fail by Canon, you lose the 100 to 300 uh, focal range, so which is just a bummer. But you do get that, then you go out to 700 millimeters and it goes to, I think, F10, so it's even slower. It's definitely viable. I have used the 1.4 converter quite a bit. I got this shot of a Rufus field wren that was on the R5, but it's well and truly usable. Now I did use this uh, combo together, I did do a video and I managed to get some shots of swans, turquoise parrots that I absolutely love and I'm very very happy with the quality. The IQ of this lens is not an issue whatsoever. Now I must admit I did have some autofocus issues with this combo, even though the IS is excellent on this lens, the R7, as I mentioned, does have some issues and this lens is no exception. I did struggle at times um, and it's just something we have to deal with with the R7. Okay, let's finish up this video with a few awards. The first one is best bang for the buck. If you want the best budget lens available, then you can't go past the RF 100-400. The fact this lens performs as well as it does at a quarter of the price of the EF 100-400 is just a testament to the value. You can't go wrong with this lens. Okay, the next one is the best overall lens and it would be no surprise to any of you, it has to be the RF 100 to 500. I've gone on and on about it, but it really is that good. If you're investing in the RF system long term, it's well worth the investment. Uh, it's super sharp, I don't need to say any more about it. This lens would be the lens I would choose to go with the R7 or any of the R series cameras if you want a zoom lens. All right, so the best reach without a doubt goes to the RF 800. No other way you're going to get that 800 millimeters in this price point. When it locks on, when it's sharp, when you've got good light, it's hard to beat. For 800 millimeters, uh, you know, it's pretty good. It has its issues, but you're not going to get the reach any other way. So if you want reach, this is the lens. Okay, so the most overpriced lens, without a doubt, it's got to be the EF 100 to 400. At 2400, it's just a little bit steep. For another 500, you can get this lens, which is vastly superior. So I wouldn't be recommending going out and buying this new. Maybe secondhand, pick it up or if you've already got it, all good, but I wouldn't be buying this brand new, I don't think. Okay, the lens that wins the biggest surprise has to go to my trusty old 405.6. It's so sharp, it's just ridiculous. It performs so well on the R7, and it's just amazing. I can still get the quality of shots I get from such an old lens. So yes, it misses out on those FPS and it lacks IS, but um, you know, I'm a little bit biased, but Overall, a wonderful lens to use and very, very surprised with its performance. Okay, so the last award is the most confusing award. It has to go to the Sigma 150-600. to It just confuses me, this lens. I'm in a real quandary. You know, it's so sharp. You get 600 millimeters. It's a great price. It's a well-built lens, but it's just that autofocus, and, and I, I just can't get over that, unfortunately. It's just such an issue, and um, you know, it's such a shame. I really do wish we had an RF version of this lens. If we did, I'm sure it would be a no brainer for all of us, but at the moment, I'm just undecided about this lens. Um, and I guess that's where I have to leave it. It's up to you to decide whether you buy this one. Uh, I just need to quickly address that I haven't talked about the video features of any of these lenses on the R7. The main reason for that is that I'm just struggling with any of them to get handheld usable video footage because I shake so much the IBIS um, of the R7 is just getting lots of movement. I can't get real stable footage with any of the lenses. This one, the 100-500 and the 100-400 are probably the best out of the bunch but I'm not sure I'm confidently going to be shooting handheld video. Now it works much better on the R5. I don't know why there's such a difference between the R7 and the R5's IBIS but there is and uh, it's something I need to work on but just be prepared if you get these lenses and you want to shoot video, you're probably going to have to use a monopod or a tripod.
So I'd really love to know what lens you have chosen. What are you using with the R7? Let's make the comments section a really useful resource for those looking for it. So if you watch this video, check the comments below. It's often people who've used lenses for long periods of time who have the best idea and the best knowledge. So thank you to those that comment below. Let's make it a wonderful resource for everyone to use and share going forward. Um, what an epic video. If you made it this long, thank you. <laughs> I took so many photos, over 33,000 as I mentioned, went out into the field 15 odd times, tried all these lenses, got photos that are going straight into my catalogue that I'm so happy that I took. Um, I don't begrudge this video, but it took a long time. I think over 100 hours I've invested into it. So by the time I've written the scripts, I've gone out into the field, I've done all the planning, editing the video takes forever. Now, if you like my content and you want me to continue making it, I do appreciate the support. So you can support me directly by either becoming a member, that's for the price of less than a cup of coffee per month. There's a join button. You get these cool little birds next to your name that you might've seen in the comments, and that directly supports me. If you don't wanna pay a monthly subscription, you can just do a one-off donation. There's a super thanks button, that little heart under the video, it's new. You can push that, you can write a comment there donate a certain amount of money and that comes helps me and I'm very appreciative of all that support helps me to continue making this long form content that I hope you appreciate so until the next video happy birding take care and see you later I better text my wife and let her know that I am still alive it's getting late <laughs>